This video is sponsored by me and you. Find out more at the end. Hello everyone, my name is Apostala Eddin. I make videos talking about my journey out of Islam and other related topics. Today I want to point out how the concept of a kafir in Islam is not only absurd and oxymoronic, but it undermines the validity of the entire religion. Up, 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 up. I'm not saying that this disproves Islam, because Islam was never proven true to begin with, but it definitely doesn't help make it seem any more credible. And this concept is not unique to this one religion, so if you're familiar with another religion, you might notice the similarities. In Islam, a kafir is a disbeliever. That's it. Thanks for watching. Make sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss. Just kidding. It's not that simple. In Islam, a kafir is a disbeliever, yes. But do you know the etymology of the word? The word kafir in Arabic means someone who commits kufr. And the word kufr means covering up. In the context of this religion, it means the denial or hatred of the truth and covering it up. In other words, a kafir is someone who knows the truth of Islam but denies it anyway. Not because they're not convinced, but because of other reasons, like arrogance or hatred or loving sin. And this isn't my personal interpretation, it's all from Islamic sources. Some Muslims really think that someone would have extramarital sex and drink wine for 70 years, then get tortured eternally, instead of doing all that in heaven. No sane person would make that trade. So while the word kafir could be used in a more general sense to refer to someone who doesn't believe in God or Islam, this definition is the one that the author of the Quran used to address disbelievers and slander them. Minor tangent, the word mushrik means someone who commits shirk, and shirk means worshipping anything aside from Allah. It's the unforgivable sin. And Nawawi explains that shirk could involve worshipping idols and other creatures while admitting in Allah's existence, as the kuffar of Quraysh allegedly did. So kufr is more general than shirk. And Bin Baz explains that shirk includes those who ask for help from the dead or jinn or idols or stars and so on, or those who make animal sacrifices for them. When you stop working backwards from the conclusion that the Qur'an is perfect, you start to see a constellation of imperfections. In this case, note the extremely imprecise use of words. The Qur'an uses shirk and kufr interchangeably when they are two vastly different concepts. There are kuffar, meaning disbelievers, who aren't polytheists or idolaters. And most mushrikeen, meaning idolaters or polytheists, most mushrikeen in the world don't acknowledge Allah's existence at all. So the Qur'an's generalizations are factually incorrect. It is painfully obvious to a non-Muslim that the author of the Qur'an was operating with a very limited view of the world, which was mostly the environment surrounding Muhammad. The author, or authors, clearly could not comprehend how humanity at large thought or behaved. So how could the author be an all-knowing God? There's a lot more I could say about shirk, but going back to the topic of this video, the essence of kufr is denial. Not honest disagreement, not being unconvinced, but denial. So a kafir is a believing disbeliever, which is an oxymoron, meaning a self-contradicting word. We're supposed to believe that many sane human beings know Allah is real, know Islam is true, but choose to deny it all anyway. The same sort of false rhetoric can be seen in some sects of Christianity, or MLMs, or cults, or other high control groups. They say that the people who leave or point out the flaws in your group are doing so because of ulterior motives or flaws in their character, rather than a difference of opinion or not being convinced of your claims. In Christian speak, they say that rejecting Jesus as your Lord and Savior is rejecting your own nature, it is rejecting the knowledge that is written on your heart. In Islam, the Quran attempts to drive that point home with the use of archetypal kafir characters like Fir'aun and Abu Lahab and the devil himself. It paints a very simplistic narrative of an evil villain who wags his fist at a prophet and at God. This is all a pious believer needs to believe in the existence of such people today, because the Quran is supposed to be the true word of God. So if God said that such unidimensional characters exist, then they must exist, even if we can't spot them. If you google the types of kafir in Islam, you'll find a laughable list that ranges from kufr of arrogance to kufr of hatred, citing examples from Islamic stories to make their point. And it's mighty convenient that these examples exist in stories but not in real life, just like miracles. Though believers can speculate about disbelievers' intentions and they can claim to spot signs of kufr anyway. And that's what's so insidious about this concept. A kafir can explain to a Muslim their reasons for not believing, not that they owe them that. And the Muslim can still conclude that the kafir is so deep in denial that they're in denial about their denial. Believers assert that they and their book know you better than you know yourself. And how can you argue against that? You're a kafir. Nah. -uh. When the starting position is that those who disbelieve are either misinformed or intellectually dishonest, then the wisest thing to do is to drop the topic. Because there's no point talking to someone who will accuse you of subconsciously lying once you disagree with them. There is no room for informed and honest disagreement. This isn't a critique of Muslims alone, because like I said, it's not a concept only present in Islam. 
It is a critique of this ad hominem strawmanning and dismissive approach to disagreement. You can see this approach in discussions about politics as well, not just religion. But in this case, it is a critique of the religion itself and its allegedly perfect God. An all-knowing, all-wise God would understand that most people don't believe because they're not convinced, not because they do and they're lying about it. Belief is not a choice. If you think it is, I invite you to wholeheartedly believe in another religion for a week. You may practice it and chant its prayers, but you won't believe unless you're somehow convinced that it's actually true. Philosophers and laymen can argue in good faith about the existence of God, or about the meaning of life, or how to find morality. We don't see different philosophical views as manifestations of evil with only one being good. So why do we do that with religion? And at the end of the day, the question of the existence of God or gods or a specific religion are to a large extent philosophical disagreements. People can and do disagree all the time while being intellectually honest. Disagreeing does not mean that you're a knowing denier. And even being wrong does not mean that you're a bad person. Let me clarify what I mean with an analogy. Say I'm having a debate with someone about the taxes in our state. I say that taxes are good because they fund social services and education and infrastructure, which raises the standard of living and so on. And I think that there is inefficiency and corruption that need to be addressed so that we get our money's worth. The other person argues that taxes should be reduced because we can never fully trust the government to efficiently and honestly use our hard-earned wages. So we're better off having more money in our pockets and using private companies to get the same services. We can both genuinely want what's best for ourselves and the other residents of the state, but we're convinced about different ways of getting there. We can point to case studies and examples of other states to support our respective opinions, but at the end of the day, we cannot be sure of what the future holds in this specific circumstance when we follow either approach. If I had a time machine and I could observe two timelines, one where we tried my approach and one where we tried theirs, I could know with hindsight and certainty which of us was correct. So let's say I used the time machine and I found out that I was correct. Does that mean that they are a bad person? Or that they must have known that they are wrong but they took that position out of greed? Granted, it may be the case that some people who want lower taxes are greedy and selfish little wealth hoarders, but I wouldn't be justified to rant and rave about how anyone who supports lower taxes is greedy, terrible, truth-denying scum of the earth. Can I claim that all libertarians are knowingly evil? That's essentially what Allah does in the Quran. Lots and lots of verses are dedicated to misrepresenting and insulting kuffar al mushrikeen and promising them all sorts of humiliation and torture in the afterlife. A believer might find it scary and foreboding, but a non-believer might find it really pathetic. Like a red pill podcast bro who rants about how women are tramps, and if you disagree, it's because you're a soy boy beta simp, or because you're a low value woman. If the author replaced those verses with a way to actually make Islam self-evident and impossible to not believe, then that would be a lot more productive, and we wouldn't be in this situation to begin with, where gullibility and obedience are more important than proof and evidence. How can Allah not fathom that people genuinely don't believe, and that it's not just some vendetta against him, especially when he should know how the people that he created think? And he effectively has access to that time machine, so he knows in advance how most of humanity is doomed to hell by him. So how can God have any negative feelings about that, and behave as if it's some unforgivable crime that deserves his eternal wrath? What's really annoying is how arrogance is attributed to the claim disbeliever, not the claim maker. No matter what reasons you give for not believing, you might be accused by a Muslim of arrogance, which is a thought-stopping cliché. I spoke about those in another video, which you might want to check out later. I suspect that such a believer is extrapolating from the descriptions of arrogant and evil kuffar in the religious tales. But who's really arrogant here? Someone who says they're not convinced, or someone who thinks the world revolves around them and their religion, and that there's no reason to deny it unless you're wrong about the facts or unless you're a bad person? Or when a believer says that it's your duty to think and research and not rest till you find the truth, which is conveniently their religion, they're oblivious to how arrogant that is and how they won't do the same for other religions. So if you're a believer, take a step back and consider what it's like to be on the other side. If you deny the truth of another religion, which you do, is it fair to assume that it's because you're arrogant and you must not rest till you join the other religion? By the way, don't forget to hit the like button, because if you don't, you're a stubborn, arrogant hater who's in denial about actually liking the video. The point of all this isn't to say that Muslims knowingly misrepresent kuffar, or that all Muslims think this way. What I am saying is that the concept of a kafir is an essential pillar on which the concept of a fair hell is built. When God sends murderers to hell, it's easy to believe that that is fair, though it's still debatable. When God sends dictators and tyrants to hell, that's also easy to stomach. But when God sends innocent disbelievers to hell, 
Well, that's a bit distressing, unless you dehumanize them and associate a bunch of negative attributes to their disbelief and think that they are responsible for their own demise. They chose to go to hell because of their arrogance and hateful denial. Then it all makes sense again. If a Muslim were to realize the sheer terror of their God's injustice, that billions will burn in hell eternally because of their understandable non-belief, a Muslim might struggle to believe in God's fairness or his mercy. So they might either find a way to stretch and reinterpret the words till it all feels more palatable, or they might adopt the religion's ideas of a kafir. That is one reason why apostates and vocal ex-Muslims are such a target for hate. Because many believers think of us as the perfect kafir. We knew the truth when we were Muslim, but we threw it all away and actively fought Islam. Why? To sin, to make money, or to fulfill Allah's prediction that we will try to lead people astray. That's what's so tricky about theistic narratives. They can persuade you to reinterpret the facts, and those narratives are difficult to disprove because they're built on unprovable religions. I mean, I do ask for donations because this work takes a lot of time and effort, not because this is easier or more profitable than being a Muslim who works at an office. And I do fulfill the prediction that I am leading people astray, if by that they mean talking about the truth which believers try to suppress and helping Muslims and ex-Muslims deconstruct their beliefs. But I can't disprove the wicked narrative to a believer. I can only keep doing what I'm doing and hope that they someday actually listen. The label of a kafir is a necessary plot device, and a straw man and a boogeyman. If believers realize that most good people will go to hell over a technicality, they might notice the holes in the narrative. If you acknowledge that most people sincerely don't believe in Islam, and that you would have done the same thing if the roles were reversed, then it becomes very hard for you to see Islam or Allah the same way. Because what kind of perfect God doesn't understand the human psyche? If Allah's description as just and merciful and all-knowing is not true, what else in Islam is not true? These holy verses can override someone's empathy and morality, and convince them that disbelievers not only deserve eternal torture, but that believers will be sitting on couches watching and laughing as it happens. If God said it, then it must be good, and we must enjoy the idea of our enemies burning. I see this sort of comment all the time, believers gloating that they cannot wait for the day of judgment so I will get what I deserve, while they laugh in heaven. To bring it back to my tax debate analogy, that's like me wishing that the other person loses all their money and becomes homeless with no social services because they refuse to fund them, while I watch and laugh from my living room couch. How petty and sadistic is that? Again, I'm not saying that most Muslims think this way, but that's the way the author of the Qur'an thinks, so I'm not surprised when I see it echoed among believers. So, what about the rest of the believers? How do they make sense of this? Like I said, the majority of Muslims aren't sadistic, and I suspect that there would be even fewer such people if the Qur'an hadn't encouraged it. The rest of the believers either don't think much about this problem or find an apologetic retort that puts a band-aid on it. For example, most Muslims I spoke to about this topic told me that they are not as wise as God, so they cannot be burdened with understanding his ways, and that Allah knows best, and so on. More thought-stopping cliches. They'd also say that nobody knows the fate of any individual, Muslim or otherwise, so we can't say who's going to hell. And they sometimes cite the story of a prostitute who gave water to a dog and God forgave her for it, essentially saying that God might judge people based on their deeds, not their beliefs. If it's about being kind to dogs, I guess a lot of kuffar are going to heaven already. Why even bother with Islam, a religion that puts restrictions on dog ownership? Just adopt a dog and save a life. And I don't just mean yours. I find that sort of answer to be a cop-out because I cannot assess God's fairness by his exceptions to the flawed rule. I'm assessing the rule itself. So to say that God mandated belief only to turn around and disregard the rule when he wants to look merciful is to portray God like a two-faced politician. Why can't he just say what he means? And why can't he be consistent? And I'm not inquiring about the fate of any particular person. I am criticizing the reality that Islam paints, a reality where the majority of humanity is going to hell. That is the reality Islam promises even after you subtract however many dog-loving prostitutes God saved. Another apologetic retort is that not every Muslim is going to heaven. Some go to hell if they commit enough sins. To which I'd say, that's a red herring. The contention is that belief is used as a criteria at all. No matter how good of a person you are, if you don't believe the right thing, the Quran says on and on again that you're destined for hell. And Islam seems to misunderstand and misrepresent people's reasons for not believing. Besides, you can be a terrible human being, say, a mass murderer, but as long as you die a Muslim, you have a chance at escaping hell after paying for your sins. While my sweet old neighbor Deborah, who makes me cookies, is tortured forever. Does that sound fair to you? So to steel man some apologetics surrounding this topic, let's first look at the main categories of non-believers that Islam recognizes. You've got your kuffar and your mushrikeen, and murtaddin and munafiqeen. There's also ahlul kitab and ahlul fatra, and lastly, al-hunafa. 
We've already discussed the first two, disbelievers and polytheists. Murtaddin are apostates, meaning people who left the religion of Islam. As you can imagine, Allah does not view them favorably. According to the Islamic legal system, Sharia, they are to be executed if they do not rescind their apostasy. And on the day of judgment, they go to hell. Munafiqeen are the hypocrites who pretend to be Muslim, supposedly for personal gain. Muhammad was paranoid about their presence among the believers, as the Quran shows. But I can imagine that at least some of them pretended to be Muslim to avoid paying extortion money or enslavement or death, which are all consequences of Muhammad and his posse raiding a tribe and demanding their conversion. In fact, there are Muslims today who tell apostates like me to shut up and pretend to be Muslim to avoid persecution and punishment. The law of someone leaving his religion and being punished can only be applied in a Sharia state. How can I know that someone left his religion? The only way a Muslim or a state can establish that an individual has left the fold of Islam is for that individual to come himself and state, declare clearly in the public that he left the religion of Islam. So now he's not just leaving Islam, now he is inciting other people to leave Islam as well. Ya akhi pick a lane. Do you hate hypocrites or do you encourage us to be hypocrites? Ahlul Kitab means people of the book. Those are the Christians and the Jews. People with books that were supposedly from the same God, but the books got corrupted somewhere along the way. Allah's judgment of them is unclear. Muhammad made alliances with them at times and fought them at other times, and the mainstream opinion is that they should now convert to Islam to be judged favorably. Ahlul Fatra are people of the period, meaning people who lived during a period of time in between prophets. This classification may also apply to people who have not received the message of Islam at all, even after the last prophet, Muhammad. Scholars disagree on what their fate is. Some think that they're destined for hell, some think that they'll be judged based on their deeds instead of their beliefs, while others think that they will be tested after their death. One narration says that Allah will order them to walk into hell. If they obey, they are saved. If they refuse and disobey, they'll be tortured eternally. So Allah plays messed up mental games with them like some sort of thriller movie villain. And maybe it's just me, but if I'm awoken from death by an angel or God, and I'm asked if I believe in this plot, I can't imagine saying anything but yes. However, the test seems to be about some innate quality in a person that determines whether or not they would have believed had they been given the message, which is not at all how humans think or believe. People's beliefs and decisions are shaped by many things, including their life experiences. But if it was all predetermined anyway, how is that fair? And lastly, there are the Hunafa, which are the monotheists who supposedly followed the religion of Abraham and or rejected idolatry and polytheism. Some scholars say that the Hunafa who existed before Muhammad may be judged favorably, while the ones who receive his message are expected to convert to Islam. A lot of these labels are not mutually exclusive. One can be a kafir and a mushrik, or a kafir and a munafiq, and so on. There might be some other labels that I missed, but these are the main ones I could find in the Quran and the Hadith and the opinions of scholars. There is no clarity in the Quran or in Islam in general. And the reason I explained all of this to you is to leave no room for ambiguity or slippery apologetics and to demonstrate that there is no label for someone who honestly isn't convinced of Islam. So let's take a few case studies and classify them. I'll mention a large number so we can ignore the occasional mercy saved by Allah that goes against his general rules, and ignore all the silly apologetics about how a particular kafir might hypothetically convert in the future. Take the example of a million Hindus who lived and died in India. The majority of them will not convert to Islam. They are considered kuffar and mushrikeen and destined for hell, no matter how good they are as people. Islam asserts that they should have used their mind to deduce that monotheism makes more sense than polytheism. Then they should have sought out the most truthful monotheistic religion, which is supposedly Islam. That is a baseless assertion, because polytheism solves a lot of the problems of monotheism, so in some ways it makes more sense. It's also such a self-centered view of the world, and it's ignorant of the reality of how humans think. Most people don't have the time, energy, or interest to change their religion, and they shouldn't be tortured eternally for that. And Islam isn't self-evident or the most truthful religion unless you already believe in it. This view is very circular and it denies the reality that people can justifiably view a religion as nonsensical, just like Muslims view every other religion. An apologist might say that those Hindus could be considered Ahlul Fatra because even if they heard of Islam, they never properly received the message. But if God is going to judge them by their deeds, why rave on and on about how terrible polytheists are and how they deserve torture? I made a short video talking about how spreading the message of Islam is evil, if ignorant disbelievers would have otherwise been judged only by their deeds. You should check it out after this video. And what if those Hindus traveled and lived in places where they are exposed to Islam? What if they were made intimately familiar with it in a way that paints Islam favorably? In other words, what if they received the correct message? Do they deserve to be tortured for not believing it? Ironically, the Quran condemns people who follow their father's religion. But that's precisely why most Muslims remain Muslim, even when they don't necessarily believe. 
because they're following their father's religion. In fact, if a Muslim man marries a Christian or a Jewish woman, he is not permitted to raise his children as anything but Muslim. So if a believer recognizes that mechanism working in their religion's favor, why can't they see how unfair it is to punish others for it? Moving on, what about a million atheist Swedes? What is their fate? Again, it depends on who you ask. Either they're punished for rejecting the truth and choosing sin and worldly pleasure over guidance, or they're considered Ahlul Fatra because they didn't get the correct message. What about a million American Christians? What is their fate? Scholars disagree again, as they usually do. Some say they must convert to Islam to be saved from hell. Some even consider current sects of Christianity to be a perversion of Jesus' original message and more akin to polytheism because of the Holy Trinity. So, hellfire for the Christians. And some say that as long as they try their best to be a good Christian, Allah will judge them favorably. And again, some apologists say that they might be considered Ahlul Fatra because they weren't properly introduced to the real, true Islam. As you can imagine, this is the most popular cop-out answer. When the goal is hiding the holes in the narrative, anyone and everyone can be considered Ahlul Fatra. So the question remains, how can we tell the difference between a sincere and insincere disbeliever? And why is Allah taking disbelief so personally and assuming that the main reason people don't accept Islam is hatred of the truth? Why does Allah huff and puff at his alleged haters instead of adequately addressing those who are not convinced? And if everyone is Ahlul Fatra, where are the cartoonish kuffar? Does an insincere disbeliever even exist? Is Allah capable of making a case for himself without throwing a fit and accusing everyone of intellectual dishonesty? Does Allah not understand that the majority of non-believers are simply not convinced and don't care for this one of many religions? The answer to all of the above seems very simple to me. Those are not the words of a perfect God. Those are the words of man. Based on the Quran and Hadith, Allah resembles an emotionally dysregulated, narrow-minded, egotistical man. That is a far more sensible explanation than a perfect God that rewards you for cognitive dissonance. Back when I was a believer, I tried to make sense of Allah's judgment system. I was told that I am not as wise as Allah, so I cannot possibly understand how it's all fair, but it is fair. One time when I tried to explain this all to a Muslim friend, he said, screw the kuffar, let them burn. Why would that make you throw away the blessing of being saved? Just say alhamdulillah that you're a Muslim and pray that the kuffar convert. And I felt bad for him. His fear of hell put him in a selfish survivor mode that not only dulled his empathy, but made him blind to the plot hole that's staring him right in the face. The reality is, no matter how much you shuffle these labels around, Allah doesn't seem to understand that your religion of choice has nothing to do with the goodness of your soul. Belief is the culmination of so many factors, which include geography, indoctrination, and emotional manipulation. To think it's all about denial is a reductive, incorrect, and ignorant take. Allah is not supposed to be any of those things. I tried to keep my faith, but I couldn't. And even if I managed to believe that Allah is real and he gets to act like a tyrant because he owns everything, I couldn't force myself to love or respect him. If I believe he's real, I'd fear him and I'd recognize his terrifying power, but that's not love, is it? The lie at the foundation of this religion is that a believing disbeliever exists at all, or that they exist at a scale proportional to Allah's obsession with them. If Muslims are aware of this lie, it becomes very hard to see Islam the same way. Thanks for listening to me talk about this one topic for so long. I appreciate your viewership. If you would like to support me so I can continue to do what I do, links are in the description. I will continue sharing my thoughts for as long as I can. And to borrow an expression from the Quran, walau karih al mu'minun, even if the believers hate it. Just kidding, I'm not that petty. But thank you again to all my patrons, YouTube members, and donors. I could not do this without you. And as always, think critically and think for yourself. And consider watching one of these non-hateful videos next.